The Old Testament lesson for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is written in the fifth chapter of the prophet Amos. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. All you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground, they hate the one who reproves at the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses hewn of stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading for this day is written in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. 
But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. We've been on a roll of Sundays with texts that remind me and lift up to my mind Emily Dickinson's wisdom to say to you, should mortal lip e'er express the undeveloped freight of a delivered syllable, t'would crumble neath the weight and invite you to hope and pray that as we hear God's word come to us and think about it, perhaps even into its syllables, that we not crumble, but rather that we be filled with the gift of life, that we might live and live abundantly. Amen. I was wondering, does anybody, would anybody like to give me their cell phone? Uh, I I need a cell phone because we have a, a homeless guy who's sleeping out here and it's really irritating. It seems like I'm coming more and more often. He's left his stuff on front of the door, and I would like to have him to have a telephone so I can call him and tell him to move his stuff. But he doesn't have one, so I can't reach him. So I thought maybe somebody here would just kind of reach in your pocket and take out your cell phone and give it to me, and I'll give it to him. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> Actually, I'm not surprised. I mean, there are four or five things in my life that, that uh, I remember, remember uh, Chief Roberts in his, uh, in his ruling on, I think it was on uh, that you're protected, that, that police can't simply go into your cell phone without some kind of search warrant because in his view, if an alien came down to earth and, and looked at us, they would say, oh, look at these things that they have. What an odd body part. He thought the cell phone was really part of who we are, in some cases more than other attributes that are biological, but that's what he thought. And so I accept the idea, I wouldn't give him my cell phone. Why should you give me your cell phone to give to him? And the same goes for my wallet. When I go out the door in the morning, I check my pockets, yes, my wallet. Why is that so important? Because that's where my legal identity is. If I don't have that legal identity, I can't do anything because I don't exist in the eyes of my bank or other, the grocery store won't cash a check or anything like that. And, and it's got my health system access. It has all this stuff that are essential, essential to me. The keys to the house, to the office, the, uh, all those things that are integral parts of me. Sometimes I forget my watch, but that's attached. We have these things that, that are so close to us that, uh, that, 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 that it just is hard to distance ourselves away from them. They're so intimately connected. And there's other stuff that, that just is hard to let go of. As, as uh, we, Kate and I started out our life together, I, well, actually, I hitchhiked. After I graduated from college, I hitchhiked to graduate school with two suitcases. Uh, while I was there, you know, we met Kate, we got married, and when we left, we had a car and had to pull a little trailer of stuff. 
we'd accumulated that we couldn't get rid of or let go of or throw away or give away or sell. And then uh, we left that at my mother's house, went to Argentina, two suitcases apiece, came back from Argentina with two suitcases apiece, moved into an apartment, and we filled the space. It was amazing how that worked. So much so that when we moved one block away to a house, we had to rent a panel truck and shuttle things back and forth. We were way beyond two suitcases, way beyond. And then when we moved from that house to Connecticut, we needed to get one, uh, half of one of those big vans. We were getting more and more stuff. And along the way, some of that stuff, my mother died. And we have her sofa and her china and her silver. And then Kate's mother and father passed away. And all of a sudden, there's furniture and this stuff that and my grandparent, my grandmother's china cabinet, the other grandmother's table, I can't part with those things. They're part of who I am. That's how I stay connected with my roots. All this stuff. And now our daughters have their stuff in our house. And, <laughs> and now as we think about packing to move again, you start going through this and you try to peel away the layers and with a real commitment to get rid of my stuff. And I can't do it. It's really hard, isn't it? to let go of your stuff, whether it's your cell phone or the, uh, the china set that was handed down to you from your great-grandparents' generation, or the chair in our house that's over 350 years old coming down through the generations. Incredible. So I really get it. I really get it when the man goes to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to inherit a life that is enduring, that will pass through the ages, that, that has eternal eternity. It's scaled to this uh, eternal value of life. And Jesus says, you're lacking one thing. What I want you to do is I want you to take all your stuff, all of it, all your technology, all your heirloom furniture, your antiques, your family legacy things, and I want you to barter it, trade it, sell it, and whatever you get, I want you to give it to the people who are bent over, those poor people, the beggars who go through life like that, bent over. Give it to them, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And his reaction... I had loved the word, the way, the one Greek definition, he was rendered gloomy. <laughs> and he was distressed. I get it. I mean, it takes a lot of uh, uh, air, oxygen out of your air. Out of, it, it knocks the wind out of you. If you think, I'm going to be a good and faithful servant. I'm going to be the good person. I'm going to be the faithful one. And to go to the one you're looking to for guidance and he tells you to do something that you cannot do. Can any of you get rid of you have a lot of stuff or a little stuff? I've been in homes of people in this parish where the only stuff they had was beds, chairs in the living room. They had no cabinetry with no cabinetry with drawers or things. They have closets for clothes. But compared to their stuff collection, I am so overwhelmed with how much stuff I have. But then I go and visit others where I don't have much stuff at all. But I cannot get rid of my stuff. I just can't do it. Don't have the power to do it. Don't have the willpower. So what do you do? What do you do? I can't do it. Well, this is a problem, is it? Is in your psyche, do you believe there's anything that you cannot do? That you simply don't have the power to do? This is a very American question because the ideology that we've grown up in, the environment, is that we are people who. Um, should function independently. We shouldn't be dependent on others. That we have a pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality in the Americas. That, and if you can't do it, if you can't do, pull your own weight, if you can't make your own way, then there's something wrong with you. And, and this is one of the disputes, the underlying fault lines in our culture right now. Does anybody have the ability to do everything that they need to do to live? Isn't that one of the dilemmas, the arguments that is running through our society today? What obligation 
should we have to give up a piece of our technology so that somebody else can have some? What obligation do we have to reduce our carbon footprint and maybe turn down our lights so that other parts of the world can brighten up theirs? What obligation do we have to do these things, to sell, to give up the things that we have, our stuff, and maybe humble ourselves so that others can be raised up? And do we have the power to do that? Well, the disciples are upset. You know, for people who have stuff, Jesus says, if you've got a lot of stuff, it's harder for you to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, or if that seems preposterous, the camello in Greek is a pun for rope. I, sometimes my eyesight is getting to the point where a little thread is hard enough to get through the eye of a needle, let alone a rope or a camel. He says how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God repeatedly. And the disciples, who basically are coming from family business backgrounds are looking at him and saying, what are you talking about? Who, who can be saved then? Can anybody be saved? And Jesus says, no, it's impossible for you. You just can't do it. This is a very countercultural thing because my hunch is that that the dominant feeling that you have is, yes, we can. Yes, we, yes, I can. No, you can't, says Jesus. God alone. For mortals, all these things are impossible, but for God, all things are possible. And you, like it or not, are dependent upon that God. Now, this is scary territory, I believe, for most people, because... That means you're dependent on somebody who has a lot of power over your life. And this is where Hebrews kind of comes in and, and weighs in saying God's word is living and it's dynamic. It's full of energy. It's got juice. It's got lots of ergs. The Greek word is ener it, it combines in erg, energy. It's dynamic in your life and that dynamism plays out like a two-edged sword that can cut through you and even separate your sinew from your bone. It can, can penetrate your heart and slice your heart, mind, body, and soul into pieces. It has that power. I was trying to translate that into technology today and I was thinking that it's like a hybrid between 24-7 uh, video surveillance on you combined with uh, MRI to measure the chemical dispositions and changes that are flowing through your brain, then an algorithm that translates that into anticipating your intentions and behavior, linked into some kind of orthoscopic laser surgery that when all of a sudden you look like you're on the wrong path, it goes zap. God can zap you. But, Hebrews says, we do not have a uh, God or a high priest who uh, cannot sympathize with us. We have a Lord who has experienced the limitations that life imposes on us. And we have out of this priestly Lord who out of that experience extends compassion to us, is ready to suffer with us, walk the distance with us, lift us up. That's the Lord. That's the God who can do all things, that the things we cannot do, we have a compassionate, caring Lord who can do that. And so rather than approach this text with with being overwhelmed because, frankly, I just can't get rid of my stuff, Lord, and I'm not ready to follow you if that's the requirement. I just can't do that. We have one who comes to us and says, I get it. I get you. You get, I get you. I understand that and out of compassion, Hebrews tells us, we are invited to to approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. The word is grace. The, the, the surprise, the pleasant surprise that despite who we are, we are embraced and claimed. 
that in spite of the things that we have done and the things we have left undone, that God is prepared to set that aside as indicated in our confession where we started today and extend forgiveness to us that we might live together with Christ in faith. In some ways, the fear we've had a run of Sundays where we've been talking about difficult things, but talking about your possessions, talking about your cell phones, talking about your wealth, and we are wealthy people. This week, uh, they had the public uh, news release that extreme poverty in the world as a percentage has shrunk and declined, but they have raised the, the benchmark those who are extremely poor are living on a dollar and 25 cents a day in our world to achieve the minimum number of calories required to eat and live. If you do not think you are wealthy, you've missed the point that Jesus is talking about. If you think it is easy to change the world, you're overestimating your own power. It is by grace that God comes to us and says, I will make this journey with you. God is good, says Jesus. Only God is good. And out of that goodness, God comes to us as one who compassionately embraces, holds, and carries us forward to a better day. That's the promise of the Lord, that the best days are still to come, whether it's with the work of a call committee or the work of economic change in the world or in a world that is cast into darkness. The light is coming. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
into 